Welcome to episode number nine of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring director and editor Jeff Canoe. We learn how Mr. Canoe edited trailers for some of the most famous films of the 1960s and 1970s, including The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, The Graduate, Annie Hall, and Rocky. We also learn how Mr. Canoe's directing debut on Natural Enemies led him to edit Ordinary People, which was directed by Robert Redford and won Best Picture at the 1981 Academy Awards. Also, Mr. Canoe's involvement directing Revenge of the Nerds, one of the most famous comedies of the 1980s, and his friendships with Kirk Douglas and the late director Paul Mazursky. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch the Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter for the latest updates at Jog Road. And now we join director and editor Jeff Canoe as he discusses what led him to create his own trailer company and develop a revolutionary technique in editing trailers. The very beginning of your career, you were making uh, trailers for United Artists, uh, like The Graduate, Midnight Cowboy, uh, Rocky, and all. That was the very beginning of my career that anybody knows about. You know, there's also the beginning of my career before that. Uh, somewhere in between getting kicked out of college and that, <laughs> which was trying to be a songwriter and have a band. And uh, Why were you kicked out of college? Because I didn't go to enough classes and, and was apathetic and more interested in trying to do something, you know, like be a musician, be a songwriter. I didn't care about school. Yeah. And it was kind of stupid. I had a scholarship. I lost my scholarship. I, got, I was in Columbia. I got oh, wow. booted out. Not booted out, suspended. I'm on a one year's leave of absence since 1964. <laughs> and they still send me alumni stuff, and it's like I'm going to come back. Well, they always want donations. <laughs> yeah. So that, and so, and, and in that window of time, I sort of stumbled into the trailer world because I was, I just had this gopher job at United Artists at a neighbor. Was this in New York City? Yeah, it was in New York. New York? Yeah. A neighbor of mine, my father died and when I was a senior in high school, and this neighbor felt sorry for me, and he offered me this part-time and summer job at UA, doing nothing really, getting, getting coffee and getting cigars for the guys. And, yeah. whatever. and I, I was just doing it because nothing else to do, and meanwhile still focusing on trying to become a songwriter or a musician. Little by little, I realized, okay, that, that other stuff may not happen, and I better look around at what I'm doing now. And they made me the, the assistant to their trailer maker. They had an in-house. It was, one of the, it was the beginning of the complete change of the way movies were advertised. It used to be all the studios had in-house. They, they called them advertising and publicity. and It wasn't marketing. That was, that's, that's many, many years later it became marketing. Okay. Uh, Anyway, so I was the gopher in the advertising department, and they made me the trailer guy's assistant, which meant whatever he wanted me to do, I just did. And Luckily, that particular guy let me do a lot of things that normally he wouldn't, like let me write copy, let me learn how to edit, different things like that. And he would always take whatever I did and present it as his work, which was fine. I didn't care. I was a kid. And then... Somewhere. What was one of the first trailers uh, that you put yeah. together? Well, that I put together on... I never put anything completely together on my own then. Yeah. But I would I cut the, the music tracks for like movies like Hawaii and uh, some James Bond and this and that. And I wrote some copy and uh, I was just lit learning. Yeah. And I would do storyboards that he would then go over and present for an Elvis Presley movie called Frankie and Johnny and things like that. And then getting kicked out of school, Vietnam War, and make, me making this decision to get married to avoid the draft, all sort of came together. And uh, so I went to this guy, my boss, and I said, could I get a raise? I'm about to get married. And he said, no. He said, uh, I, I'm not going to go to bat for that. I was making ninety three twenty five a week. Mm -hmm. And I, the next level up because it was sort of a union publicist skill thing the next level up was 103.25 so he, the guy wouldn't get me the extra ten dollars so I went to the <laughs> vice president and I said can I get a raise and he said well what do you do because I was always in the background yeah and I said well I did a lot of things and he goes well can you write down a list for me and then I'll go to my superior and tell him and maybe you'll get the raise so I wrote up this long list of I did the music for this and wrote the copy for that and did the storyboard for that and yada 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 Presented that 
A couple days go by, I get a phone call from the higher up guy, come over to my office. Go to his office, closes the door. I start to speak and he goes, sit down. Mm. What? He goes, you little Sammy Glick prick. Sammy Glick was like, this. What makes Sammy run yeah, the that novel? Guy the, who yeah. would stab anybody in the back to get ahead. <laughs> I go, what? He goes, you wrote this list taking credit for stuff that your boss did while your boss is giving you the opportunity to learn and you try to sabotage him and stab him in the back. I wasn't. He goes, shut up. <laughs> anyway, I got fired. So now I was getting married, kicked out of school, I didn't have a job, started offering myself around to the existing companies that did trailers and whatever. And yeah. Looking all through New York City. Yeah, yeah. They're all in New York. And I'm, I'm looking for, you know, a similar job to mine as I'm an assistant kind of a job for a hundred bucks a week and everybody said no you're not worth it so nobody hired me and I, there was a, a another guy that worked in the, this one trailer company who was sort of a real Brooklyn-y ballsy kind of guy yeah. and he also was a frustrated uh, rock and roll guy so we used to be friends on that bonded on that level um, anyway so this guy said why don't you start your own trailer company yeah. So I said, who's going to hire me? I'm 20 years old. What are they going to hire me? I can't schmooze with the guys. I mean, I have no credits. Come on, it's crazy. Yeah, but you know some people and uh, you should try it. And somehow he like talked me into trying it. So I rented an editing room and sort of declared myself in the trailer business. Yeah. And we got one assignment. It was, it was called, uh, it was the movie A Man and a Woman, Claude Lelouch. Film. Yeah, big foreign language film that year at the Oscars, I think. Yeah, yeah. In 60, this was 66. And somebody let me do a, a version of a trailer on that. So that was my first thing that I did on my own. And I loved doing it, and it came out pretty good. And we made $1,500 for that. Wow. Wow, that was big. <laughs> and that gave us enough money to stay in business another month. And then we got one more assignment, and then one more, and little, little things. But uh, television commercials for a movie, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum... Another thing called After the Fox, a Peter Sellers movie. And all of a sudden, I was sort of establishing something. And then it came time to do the schmoozing with the clients, and there I was no good. And so they sort of lost interest after a while and started giving their business to other people who were better schmoozers. And yeah. so now we were sitting there in this rented editing room waiting to run out of money and playing chess and going to the movies. And we realized there's a guy down the hall who makes pornos. Uh, Maybe we can work with him. So we knocked on his door and said, hey. And he said, yeah, that would be great. You guys can edit the pornos while I go shoot the next one. That way I don't have to shoot it and then edit it myself. That very I, efficient. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, we edited a couple of movies. A movie called Thigh Spy. A movie called Surfside Sex. A movie called Angle of Love. And all of a sudden we're in that business for like 500 bucks a movie editing the whole movie. <laughs> and we're doing that. This was a 66. And then... Then I got this idea, oh, that somehow we ended up working on the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly trailer. Really? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember oh. exactly how that came about. So I did that, and, and a fistful of dollars. Yeah. And so what, what were you learning about editing trailers at that time? I mean, were there sort of essential elements that you thought made a trailer really pop and uh, reach an at, audience? At the beginning, it was, it was imitating what people had done before. Yeah. But what I did learn was go through the movie... This is, became what I... I don't know how anybody else did it, but what I would do is I would go through the whole movie, make notes, figure out what scenes might work out of context, what lines, what scenes, what shots, yeah. and like break the whole movie down like that into those little categories and then build it back up. And if you came up with a, a concept or a copy concept or whatever, or very often the movie studio knew what they wanted to say about it, and so they gave you this sort of copy direction and you had to work with that... So it was about dissecting movies and figuring out what parts of them work well out of context or juxtaposing two things that you wouldn't think would be interesting, yeah. but they would work as, as a unit together. And Did it ever feel like you were trying to just tell the story in a very compressed amount of time? Yes, in a, in well, it, it did, but that wasn't the way they used to do it. They used to have a lot of copy. They used to say, you know, now from the makers of such and such, the, the romantic story of blah, 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 with lots of copy, type on the screen and... And it was very old-fashioned trailer. And in fact, all the trailers at one point were done by one place called National Screen Service. And they did everything for every movie studio because they did it for free because then that gave them the right to 
distribute the actual trailers, which they rented to the theaters. So their main business was renting trailers to theaters. Yeah. So they would throw in the creation of... Would they ever air on television as well, or was that a Not back then. Uh, there was not that much television advertising for movies. That just started to happen back then. Yeah. And no one ever advertised on network TV. It was always local TV. Now, then it became network, then it became, you know, a whole different world. With, with market research and back then it was always what the either the head of the studio or the head of marketing thought it, it should be like there was no testing things with consumers to see how, how they would react it was just the, yeah. the gut feeling of a guy with a cigar and sometimes he was right and sometimes he was wrong whereas now it's market research and sometimes it's right and there's so much bureaucracy and loads people. of bureaucracy yeah. and, and even within the market research you learn that the guys who run the research companies have yeah. their own egos and their own ideas. And even though they're supposed to listen to the data, sometimes that guy will go like, yeah, but I think it should be like this. And all of a sudden, now it's right back to the way it was, which is one man deciding how the movie should be presented to the world as opposed to listening to the numbers. But more and more, they, they listen to the numbers. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes not. I mean, there, there was a movie called Fearless that Peter Weir did, Jeff Bridges, Rosie Perez, very depressing movie about people who survive a plane crash. Yeah. Really downer. Very well done. Though, very good movie. Yeah. So I got at one point hired to work on the trailer for that and the direction was make it look like a comedy because mm. comedies sell and depressing movies don't. So there were like three moments in the movie that you could sort of take out of context. Jeff Bridges standing up on a roof. You think he's maybe going to kill himself and he's shouting <laughs> and when you take it out of context it looks a little silly so that's the stuff that they wanted to present and yeah. of course the movie died. Because you can't sell Fearless as a comedy. It's a serious movie about a woman who lost her baby and two people. That, and then people go to see it and realize it's not that. And then they tell their friends. Yeah, they say, sort of, yeah, well, I, <laughs> and I just had that experience last night. I saw Gone Girl last night. Yeah. The trailer absolutely presented it as a serious, dark film. Uh, Jagged Edge. Uh, you know, something about, did Ben Affleck kill his wife or not? Um, no hint that it had any twinkle or sense of humor or ironic tone. Yeah. But I don't know if you've seen it. I read the script a long time ago. Okay, well, it has like that kind of the, uh, twist in there. Well, the whole so, third act yeah. is Desperate Housewives. It yeah. gets sillier and sillier and sillier. And I was sitting there expecting to really immerse myself in a, in a David Finchery dark thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's trying to be farce. <laughs> I hated it. So I'm telling people, if you, <laughs> if you go see it based on the trailer, you're going to hate it. So you better change your expectations to get something a lot light, more lightweight. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there like I was going, what the fuck? Anyway. But, but sometimes you can. People will have like a sort of a, a backlash reaction if they get sold something the wrong way. Yeah. It might get them into the theater, but then they're going to be upset. And then word of mouth bringing people in is yeah. uh, tricky after that. Anyway, yeah. So and, and one of the things that in making trailers back then... Everything was copy and titles and some wipes and you know grab visual graphics, and I, I was kind of doing that too. But I kept thinking, maybe what if you let the movie speak for itself? You know, what if you just put together a two two and a half minute montage that compresses? It's like a, a compressed version of the, what the movie really is. Yeah, and don't try to hard sell, and maybe people will believe it more because nobody's yelling copy lines at them or wiping things across the screen. They're just seeing what they're getting. You know, it's, it's kind of almost like a free sample of a, of a product or, yeah. So I tried that a couple of times and, and it felt pretty good. And so I decided I, I'm going to try to do that wherever possible. Let the movie speak for itself. A lot of times you couldn't do it because a lot of the movies were pretty crappy or the client would say, no, 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 I want to sell it in such and such a way. But every once in a while I got away with it and, and, one of the first things, like the good, the bad, and the ugly was copy, but very sparse copy. I remember it was like this. It was like the good, the bad, the ugly, the blue, the gray, the civil war, the good, the bad, the ugly, the reason, the gold. It was just, I, I just tried to keep it like staccato like that yeah. and let, let the movie play. And everybody liked that. And 
for some reason that inspired me to go make a porno based on the good, the bad, and the ugly, which still exists, called The Wicked Die Slow. We shot it for like 30 grand. It was not very hardcore. Uh, the guy Dirty, who, Western, all that. Yeah, the, 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 the bum, everything. The, uh, Stealing, eyes, a complete the... ripoff of that, <laughs> but with a, an occasional you know, naked girl or something. And uh, <laughs> stupid. And in fact, I, I, somebody actually sent me it. They found a DVD of it, which I didn't think existed. And I watched it and I showed it to my kids and they went, shut this off. This is terrible. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the good, the bad, and the ugly clone. And I got a taste of making a movie back then. And I did one or two things like that. I did a movie called Mail Order Confidential, which was an hour long, black and white, crappy thing. And nobody put, we didn't put our names on it. Everybody on the credits was called Smith, Bill Smith, Bob Smith, Joe Smith. Uh, but it was another taste of directing and making a film. Yeah. But then in 1967, after working on a few decent movies like Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and Somebody hired me to work on this kids' movie. Uh, no stars, some music, story of a young guy. Let's get a young guy to do the trailer. So they hired me, and it was a graduate. Wow. And so I watched the movie, and I loved it, and I loved Paul Simon and his music. And I mean, there was an overlap there because at one point I had gone to Paul Simon when he had a different name, Jerry Landis, and he was the A&R guy for a record company, and he gave me a, a contract to be a performer, a songwriter for them, but that didn't work out. So there's Paul Simon's music, and there's this great movie, and I'm going to get a chance to do the trailer. So I said, I'm going to do it the, the way I want to do it, which is no copy. Yeah. And I built this montage. Nowadays, I look at it, and it's too long. But it was just the movie, and intercut with the Mrs. Robinson and Scarborough Fair and all the music and people liked it and the movie was a hit so now out of nowhere instead of going from this 21 year old or 22 year old trailer kid that nobody wanted to work with I was the guy who did The Graduate and suddenly I was getting work I was getting Midnight Cowboy I was getting lots of stuff you know the Lion in Winter and that was my career for the next 10 or 11 years. And you were really using that uh, model that you would come up with, really letting scenes play out, what, telling the story in a compressed... Not so much letting scenes play long, but, but letting not superimposing copy and, yeah. and uh, uh, any kind of crazy style stuff on the movie, just letting the movie... I mean, you know, sometimes the scenes would be very staccato and intercutting, a lot of intercutting, like... Uh, uh, the Rocky trailer, which I did, yeah. you know, it was like, there's a speech where the, the fight promoter is talking to Rocky Balboa and he says, do you believe America is the land of opportunity? Apollo Creed does. And he's going to offer some young fighter the chance of a life. So I took that speech and interspersed it with him, you know, wrapping his hands and this and that and training. So it, it was sort of weaving together the, this visual element and the this dialogue that told the story of the film, yeah. that was a good intro to the Rocky movie. And the client's only direction in the Rocky movie is don't show any boxing. Really? Because boxing movies never work. <laughs> so it's Until the, Rocky. <laughs> until Rocky. So to sell Rocky, you couldn't sell it as a fight film. And we didn't. It was all about this character. And I mean, you knew it was about a boxer, but yeah. the, the, there was never, except at the very, very, very end, there was a little bit of fighting. But otherwise, other than that, no fighting. Just... Stallone and Adrian and all that. Um, so it was a combination of letting the movie speak for itself, but doing it the way the client told you to do it. Yeah. And did you also do Annie Hall as well? Yeah. Uh, what was sort of the dynamic for that movie? Because that's not your kind of standard uh, romantic comedy. And well, I had uh, done a lot of other there. Woody movies before then. Yeah. And the way I used to work with Woody, I don't even know how we stumbled across this, but I started start on Bananas. I, I filmed Woody uh, in his editing room where I would ask him questions. You know, Mr. Allen, you, you work, you're working on your new film? And he would he'd say, yes, I am. I'd say, what's it about? And he would just ad-lib silly stuff about what it's about, you know. And then, then he'd say, ask me that again. And I would ask him again. He would ad-lib something different. And we would take the better stuff from those interviews, yeah. use them on camera, and then intercut scenes from the movie as punctuations. So it worked really well for Bananas, it worked for Love and Death, it worked for everything you always want to know about sex. And I was the guy who 
I remember Woody once asked the United Artists people, let's get the stout guy with the beard, <laughs> which I didn't like, but I got the job. Um, but Annie Hall didn't seem like a, that kind of a movie. It didn't seem like it wanted to be jokey and, you know, having Woody, like, making silly jokes about the movie. So that was more let the movie speak for itself. It was ca- And it was cast. There was a lot of cast to mention. So that, that was the structure of that. And... Uh, and that was the last Woody movie that I actually worked on. Was that? So then, uh, your first sort of big feature film was uh, Natural Enemies, which I believe Hal Holbrook and uh, Louise Fletcher yeah, won well, over the cuckoo's nest. I don't, I don't know. You want to call it a big feature film, but so I was yeah, the Oscar winning. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was I was doing I was doing trailers and making a lot of money and getting burnt out. Yeah, because the politics of the trailer business was at least as important as the work. You had to be the client's best friend and make sure nobody else sort of no infringed on that ter- territory. Yeah. So you had to go to lunch and dinner and spend weekends. And your whole life was the clients. And they always wanted to think, even though I had like eight or ten editors that worked for me at a certain point, they, they wanted to believe that I was doing everything myself on their movies. I could have my guys work on other people's movies, but on, on their movies, just me. Yeah. So I had to... I tried to work, I tried to work on Rocky and Cuckoo's Nest and Annie Hall m- myself, uh, but there were lots of other movies that I worked on where my guys would do it, but I would supervise. And uh, but it was it was very all consuming, and I I could feel it. I'm getting burnt out on this, and I'm jealous of people that are actually making movies. You know, I I used, I used to say I'm not. I don't own the restaurant and I'm not even the chef. I'm the guy that makes the menus. And I didn't feel good about that. Yeah. Even though it's a skill and, and it was a great business. I mean, my brother is in that business or was in that business after me and he made lots more money than I made. Um, so after 10 or 11 years of doing that, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I, I wanted to try making films and I found this Natural Enemies thing. It was a book that I read. I was sure, I'm sure I was in a state of major depression. <laughs> this was the most depressing book ever about a yes. man. He uh, sort of has a nervous breakdown. Right. He goes after his wife and his he, kids. He, he just wakes up one morning yeah. and realizes he's going to kill himself and his family tonight. And in the end does. Uh, and the, the, basically the, the movie is a, some flashbacks and him going through his final day looking for a reason not to do it. And it was this very dark, serious, talky, novel that became a dark serious humorless movie good I mean, yeah. I mean well written I mean the novel was good and I adapted it kind of didn't know what, what I was doing because like no, there was nobody to tell me like how to change it I just did it so this was the first uh, screenplay really that you've ever I had written one or two others yeah. but this was the first one that I tried to make into a film and because I was doing it alone and there was no investor there was no producer there was nobody nobody could tell me Hey, you can't have a 14 page phone call <laughs> in a movie. So I did. I had a 14 page phone call in the middle of the movie where Louise Fletcher finds out there's a loaded gun in the closet and suspects that Hal is going to do that and tries to talk him out of it. It's an important moment, yeah. but you just can't have a 14 page phone call. So it ended up two minutes out of the 14, made it into the final film. But you've had fil- you filmed all 14 minutes. I filmed all 14 initially. minutes, yeah. yeah. You also edited uh, Natural Enemies as well. Yeah. Right, yeah. And so I did that movie. I never intended to finance it myself. I was always trying to raise money, but it, it was really hard. And I, a producer that I knew from the trailer business said to me, the only way you're ever going to get investors is if you start making the movie. If you wait around for financing, it'll never happen. So I thought, okay, I've made money in trailers. I'm going to invest in myself. I started prepping the movie and I cast it and I'm ready to go and thinking now the money's going to come in yeah. but it didn't so then I started shooting thinking well we'll have a screening of the dailies and money will come in but it didn't then I edited it and I had a cut no money and finally I finished the movie without ever getting any outside investment and then I couldn't find a distributor even with Hal Holbrook and Louise Fletcher and Jose Ferrer and, and so it took me a long time to get it distributed when I finally did it was a company that wouldn't pay me any money up front. They would just distribute the movie and agree to spend what was really a small amount of movie 
of money to market it, yeah. but they owned these great theaters in New York. They owned Cinema One and Cinema Two. And so my movie opened Cinema Two. That was great. And played for a few weeks and then never played anywhere else <laughs> in the world. And I, I had signed away all my rights to them for nothing, you know. And so back then there was no HBO, there was no, there was nothing. There's there was no home video. Obviously. No home video. It's just like the ancillary rights were show it on airplanes and at colleges. That was about it. Yeah. So I just signed all that away. From a, like a craft perspective, what do you think you learned from that first film that sort of carried on to subsequent films? Oh, lots. I mean, first of all, from the technical aspect, I had learned by watching so many movies and dissecting so many movies, I learned without really trying about framing and shots and... and coverage to a degree Coverage. Well. Yeah. What I didn't learn was how to work with actors. The only actors that I'd ever worked with were voiceover guys who worked on the trailers, you know, where they would come in and read and I would say a little slower, a little this, a little that, and I would think, oh, so I've directed actors. It was voiceovers, but it was still directing, so I can do this. And then when I got really onto the floor with Hal Holbrook and Louise Fletcher, I realized, I don't really know how to do this. I don't know the actor's language. And I, mean, I know the script, and I know what, I'm, what the movie should look like in my head, but when Hal Holbrook said to me the first day, what's this scene about? My answer was, didn't you read it? <laughs> As opposed to, it's about uh, uh, trust, or yeah. it's about redemption, or it's about uh, he, he doesn't want to listen. You know, whatever that's the actor was looking for, I didn't know how to respond to that. So he kind of lost faith in me the very first day, and I I picked up on what I had to do, but it was it was like learning under fire. Yeah. The first day I went to the to the first AD, who was also the production manager, and I said I quit. And he said, "What do you mean you quit? You can't quit. It's your movie. It's your. It, you're, there's no one to quit to. Take a walk around the block and come back in here and." Don't be a pussy. Was that a stressful day for you Ooh. in terms of... Oh, yeah. Uh, was, I, yeah, was, I really... I meant it. I, I, you were just overwhelmed? I, yeah, I thought, yeah. I should, what made me think I could do this? I can't do this. And But he like forced me to like stay there, and I guess Hal just stopped torturing me a little bit that day, and I got through it. And I thought, all right, I've got through one day. i got 29 more days to go. And little, <laughs> little by little, I got through. Although Hal continued to torture me periodically. And... Uh, but considering all that, the movie came out pretty pretty good, and I'm, I, when I watch it, I'm not ashamed of it at all. I do understand why it never really saw the light of day and made any money. It got some good reviews, some bad, some good. Rex Reed called it the grimmest reaper ever. Uh, and then other people said it was a... And, and interesting, the thing I did right after that was I worked on Ordinary People as the, the editor of Ordinary People. Yeah. And I got that job because Redford, who I had known as a trailer maker for him, watched Natural Enemies because he was thinking of hiring Hal Holbrook to star in Ordinary People. Oh, as the Donald Sutherland character. As the Donald Sutherland character. So he chose not to do that, but he called me and he said, hey, I watched your movie. It was really good. And I was so happy to finally have somebody say something nice about the movie. (laughs) I said, oh, thank you, thank you. He goes, you know, I like the way it was shot. I like the way it was cut. And I said, you're about to direct Ordinary People. And he said, yeah. I said, where are you thinking of cutting it? And he goes, oh, I'd love to cut it in New York, where we both lived. I said, I got a perfect editor for you. He goes, who? I said, me. <laughs> he said, but I thought you wanted to try to be a director. I go, forget that. I'd love to cut your movie. He goes, okay. Next day, I get a phone call from the producer. He goes, is this Jeff Canoe? And I said, yeah. He goes, who the fuck are you? I go, what do you mean? He goes, why is Redford telling me you're going to edit this movie? You have, you have no credits. You've never edited a mo- another movie. I go, no, I just edited this movie that I just made. But have you ever edited anything, other movies? I said, well, some pornos, but we won't talk about that. Mm-hmm. He goes, this is fucking ridiculous. We have Sam Osteen, the guy who did The Graduate and Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He goes, why the fuck is Redford hiring you? I, go, I don't know, but I, I know, you know I, I love the book and I, I can work with Bob. And... Uh, the guy goes, what's your rate? I go, oh, I don't know, because I never really worked as an editor except for myself, so I don't really have you a rate. in the union either. No, no, I had to join a union to cut natural. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So I go, I don't know, what's the scale? And he goes, he goes, I'll pay you 2500 a week. I went, great. 
that sounds okay. Because Sam Mosteen was getting like 10000 or something. Uh, and I went to Chicago and worked on that movie and I was... Just so that's a, a unique situation. You not only have a first-time director, but also a director who's like a major movie star. Yeah, it was very unique. And it was great. And I, I was very lucky because... Partly because Bob and I, I guess, communicated well, but also he was a little bored in the editing room, so he didn't come around that often. So I had a lot of autonomy putting that movie together. So, and, uh, you know, I feel really good about it because, like, a lot of the touches in the movie, like the little flashes when the kid's drowning and whatever, that was all stuff that I stole from yeah. the pond. I thought it was interesting how um, that element where there are flashes back where Donald Sutherland is, for example, like on the train and he's thinking yeah. about, you know, how his son committed suicide and... The sound of the train is there, but you're just seeing the little flashes and yeah, that was all. In. That was of, all from the pawnbroker. Yes, so, yeah, yeah. I ripped off the pawnbroker pretty good, <laughs> and that wasn't in the script of ordinary people. It was just a thing to try, and and we liked it. How so. were the flashbacks uh, assembled in the script initially? It, it was more like an occasional full scene flashback, not little pawnbroker cuts things, in. Yeah, there. yeah. Uh, and towards the end, we we do. Flash, 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 and then play a moment, the drowning or whatever. Uh, but that was fun for me to try, and and uh, you know, and Bob liked it, and it stayed in, and so I felt like I had a big part in the sort of structuring of that. And uh, all of a sudden, he won the Academy Award, so it was like amazing. My first movie ever edited won the Oscar, so I started to get a lot of offers to cut other people's movies but I really wanted to be a director so I didn't, I didn't take any of those jobs which I maybe should have and now I started looking for my next project for me and I found a book that I liked and I optioned it and I adapted it again and it became this movie Eddie Macon's Run which was kind of a B movie Kirk Douglas Kirk Douglas was yeah. in it and the producer was a pretty experienced guy named Martin Bregman who was a bit of a bully and he had Al Pacino he was Al's manager and Alan Alda's manager and he was a pretty tough guy he produced a lot like Lenny I think and no, uh, no, a lot of that was Marvin Worth and, oh, Marvin and Worth, David okay. Picker but anyway yeah. But, but yeah Bergman did a lot of movies and uh, that was a kind of crazy experience because I had optioned this book written the script you know it was all my project and then because he and I had the same agent, somehow the agent got Bregman involved in my project, and so all of a sudden he was the boss. He attached himself as producer. Yeah, and, and he did get Universal to put up $5 million to make the movie. Yeah. And suddenly I was just an employee, even though I was the writer, the director, blah, blah, blah. And uh, little by little I lost power every day to the point where at the end, when I put the whole movie together and showed it to him, he said, uh, needs a new editor. I said, well, I said, the one credit that I think I really have that, I, that, that is valid is I'm a good editor. You know? yeah. So I, I don't really think you need a new editor. Goes, no, 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 I need, this sucks. I need a new editor. I said, well, I'll tell you what. You get your editor. So he got Ralph Rosenblum, who cut the pawnbroker. I think also Manny Hall uh, as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And at that point, Ralph was just, you know, he was semi-retired or whatever. He didn't. He, so he just took the gig and took the fee. Yeah. Came in, did a did whatever notes he got from the producer, and we had a kind of a handshake deal that we'll have two versions of the movie, which were, was illegal because the Directors Guild didn't allow the producer to cut his own version of the movie until after the director had finished his. But I said, if you want to cut alongside of me, I'll I'll accept that. But we're gonna have screenings of the two versions and whichever one tests the best that's the one we're going to finish yeah. so he said okay and we had back to back screenings one night in Las Vegas and mine which was longer than his the audience thought it was shorter because he had taken out certain scenes that made the movie emotionally interesting so his was more of just an action movie and mine was a little more of a character study which is what I always wanted it to be and so mine tested better. So he came up to me in the lobby of the theater, and I thought he was going to say, all right, you win. And he said, I'm going to cut your fucking balls off. And I got fired. <laughs> so I went to the studio head, and I said, look, 
here's your research, your results of the two versions of the movie. Version A tests better than version B. How, why would you, it's your money, why would you finish the one that tested worst? And the guy said, if you can't fight your own battles, I'm not going to fight him for you. Uh, this guy has too much power, he has Scarface, he has Pacino, he has Alan Alda. We're not going to protect you and alienate him. So, yeah. tough. So that was a good lesson. So Did that sort of toughen you up in a sense for later on when you're working on other movies to sort of be aware of how a producer can... It, it actually toughened me up in, in a sense. bad way. Yeah, It made me a little paranoid and a little feisty in a business that likes people to be cooperative. You know, and if you have a lot of hits, you can be as feisty as you want. But if you're somewhere in the middle, if you have a movie that doesn't work, why would they want to work with you again if you like were, were difficult in any way? And I wasn't like super difficult, but I would say what I thought. Yeah. And a lot of those guys didn't want to hear that. They wanted basically you to go, oh, sure, that's a great idea, and do what they want, because it's their money. Yeah. And it took me many years to learn that lesson, probably too late, which is why I haven't like done a lot of movies in the last... God knows, 20 years. Because uh, I pissed off some powerful people. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, take a nap. Because <laughs> I'm depressed. Now. Uh, well, I was going to move on to Revenge of the Nerds, which is so different than Ordinary People and Natural Enemies okay. and even the Kirk Douglas film. So it's sort of an interesting transition to go from very serious, uh, intimate dramas to a big rowdy comedy yes so, his, so what <laughs> happened with that was there was a man named Joe Zan who was a producer who again I had through trailers I had done trailers on a number of his movies yeah and we became friends and I guess after the Eddie Makem's run disaster I thought well my career is like over now and all of a sudden Joe Zan calls me he goes guess what I'm, I just got a job I'm head of production of 20th Century Fox I went oh my god he goes I want you to make a film for us I said, great, what? He goes, I'll send you some scripts. So he sent me several scripts, Bachelor Party, something called Gimme an F, which was about cheerleader camp, just kind of stupid movies, and this Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God, I mean, you know, I did Natural Enemies, a serious drama. I worked on Ordinary People, Revenge of the Nerds. So I, I thought, I don't even want to read this, but... Joe's a friend, all right, fine, I'll read it. So I started reading it, and I, I liked it. You know, and I related to it because most people feel like an outcast or like, like, an, like what's now known as a nerd. You just feel like you're unacceptable on a lot of levels. And I remember the first day I went to Columbia, I walked on campus, and I, I got this feeling like everybody here is smarter than me. Everybody here likes each other already, and nobody likes me. And I went to my room, and I closed the door. And I thought, that's what Revenge of the Nerds is about. It's about being unacceptable or feeling, being made to feel unacceptable. So I thought, all right, I can make this movie in my mind as a serious movie, even though it has farting and burping and silly stuff. But it, for me, it's a serious movie about self-esteem and bigotry. So I thought, all right, I can do this. So I call him up and I say, all right, I'll, I'll do the Revenge of the Nerds if I can. He goes, well, here, there's a problem. What's the problem? The producer's... Uh, I've seen your other movies and they don't even want to talk to you. They think you have no sense of humor and mm -hmm. that uh, you're, you're a big downer and they don't want to even meet with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to force them to meet with you. So you got to fly out here. So I thought, all right, this is going to be great. Um, and I didn't think of myself as a... I mean, I worked with Woody Allen and Mel Brooks on trailers and stuff, but I, I know I'm not, not funny, but I don't know if I'm a comedy director, but I guess I'll try to find out. Yeah. So I, and I was teaching a class at Columbia at the time, which was sort of ironic. I, I got offered a teaching job in the school that kicked me out. Uh, what was the class you were teaching? It was a graduate, graduate was it? Directing class uh, that I got because I had worked at the Sundance Institute and met some guy and he offered me this thing and I went, teach at Columbia? I'm there. Just because so I could like feel in my mind like they kicked me out and ha ha. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching this class, and uh, I had to fly to L.A. for uh, this job interview. And so I go out there, and I read the script a bunch of times, and I'm really thinking in terms of what, what I want to do with the movie. And I don't know, I had this three-hour meeting with the producers and some studio executive, and I guess I did well. 
because the meeting lasted a long time and I said all the right things or whatever. So I go back to New York and I get a phone call from my friend, Joe. And he goes, how'd the meeting go? I said, uh, I think it went pretty well. It lasted a long time and I think we kind of saw things the same way. Yeah. He said, well, you made one mistake. He already knew. He had, they had already reported to him. I said, okay, what was my mistake? He said, you said Risky Business was a better movie than Animal House. I said, well, it is. I mean, Animal House is really funny, but Risky Business is a better movie. It's got better tone and texture and character, and it's, it's, it's a real movie. Animal it's a little House more is, substantive. Yeah. Than, yeah. He said, well, <clears throat> that's, that was your mistake. I said, well, okay. He goes, so what kind of, if, if you got this job, what kind of a movie would you make? And I said, well, and now I realize I think I'm on speakerphone on his end I go I would make the best movie I can from this script he goes you're not answering my question <laughs> I said well I know I said I'm just saying I, I would like to make it I mean I can't turn Revenge of the Nerds into risky business it doesn't have that kind of darkness or whatever but I'd like to like, like it to be about real people I, would, I don't want it to be a cartoon about guys with tape on their glasses I, it want it to be more than that what kind of a movie are you going to make I said <sighs> All right, Joe, I know what you're trying to get me to say. You're trying to get me to say, I'll make Animal House, sir. And he said, that would be good. I said, all right, Joe, how about this? I tell you what, I told my class when I went out to audition for this job that I was flying to L.A. to audition for a job directing a stupid teenage comedy. He said, that's good. Mm-hmm. I said, all right. He goes, I want you to make a movie that not only will it never play in Cinema 2 on, in New York, but you'll never be allowed in there again. He said, all right, how about this, Joe? I'll make a movie that I'm ashamed to put my name on. He said, you've got the job. <laughs> and that was true. That's a true story. And they wanted to make everything but like an art house. Yeah, uh, yeah. Don't try to make it arty. Which, I mean, I understand yeah. that caveat, but... Uh, Did you work at all with the writers to develop oh, yeah, the script? Yeah. No, uh, no, the script... Got... This, yeah, to be, the script never stopped being worked on throughout all of the whole production. Everybody had ideas, the actors, me, people, the writers were there. It evolved from... If you read the script now, you go, oh, it's kind of pretty stupid, crappy movie, but it became more. And part of the reason was almost everyone that worked on it, Bobby Carradine, Anthony Edwards, Curtis Armstrong, they didn't really want to make a stupid movie. So we all dedicated ourselves to, we'll keep the jokes, but we, we want it to feel like it's based in reality. And a little more grounded. Grounded in, yeah. in life and character and stuff and we got a lot of that in there, although there were moments that I shot that never made it into the movie. You know, there was a bullying moment that after yeah. they wrecked the nerd's house, the nerds come running up, having just won the, the contest, and the, the jocks are on the porch of the nerd's house, and they throw Anthony Edwards on the ground. And it, it's like a serious bullying moment, which for me was very important because I had experienced stuff like that in high school, and I thought people are going to relate to this. We had some previews in the audience. It bummed them out. They couldn't laugh anymore after that, so we had to take out that moment. Yeah. And uh, how important do you think previews are for a comedy? Does that critical? Yeah, absolutely critical. And had before *Adventure of the Nerds*, I would have said no. You know, you, you go by your instinct, your creative. But the the uh, the studio when they when they still kind of didn't trust me, they hired a line producer who had done literally Animal House and Cheech and Chong movies, a guy named Peter McGregor Scott. And his job, he told me, was spying on me and reporting back if he doesn't think that I'm doing a good job comedically. So he was on set with you yeah. throughout the film? we became really close friends and we did three other movies together. And, but back then, he was sort of the studio comedy watchdog. And... He got comfortable right away with the fact that I, I, I could do this and make it funny. And then we, we, we just had a great time making that movie. Yeah. And he was no longer my adversary. We were partners in the, that process. And he said to me, first thing you got to do, mate, is you got to start having previews before you show the studio the film. I said, huh? He goes, yeah, you get 100 people in a room, 50 people, you show them the movie, and you feel how it plays. I go, but what if there are 50 wrong people, you know? going to let those 50 people dictate the fate of this movie you go do it mate you go do it so I said okay so we started having we had about 10 small little previews like that yeah. and it was a revelation to see you could feel 
the energy fade where it need, where it was like a little too long or something happened to sort of change the tone yeah. uh, and you'd make an adjustment and have another screening and that would feel... So you're understanding the pace if it was dragging oh, oh, at certain points. The pace and, and even even just the content. You could realize, oh, like the bullying moment has to go. Yeah. As soon as we took that bullying moment out, it went from like scoring in the 50s to scoring in the 70s. Just taking out that one little... 30 second moment because the audience then could be in a good mood all the way to the end as opposed to be like bummed out uh, so that became I adopted that previewing process I did that on every single movie after Nerds yeah. what do you think of like the Nielsen screenings where they have sort of the, you know you fill out like a written survey and does that help at all or yeah I mean if there's a consensus if you get a, 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 a like a sort of a Cross section of people all saying the same thing. Yeah, maybe you better listen. If you're making a movie that you want to be successful, that you want people to go out and tell their friends about, you have to pander to that a little bit. Um, maybe not as much as I did because on my subsequent movies, I would really rely on that process, and I would lose scenes that I love just because the preview audiences kept telling me, you know, they don't weren't crazy about that moment and tighten the movie and shorten the movie and sometimes I would have a movie and it would fail anyway like the Kathleen Turner movie for Warshawski you know where I took out some stuff that I really loved and the movie bombed anyway so it was like why didn't I just leave my stuff in so when I watch the movie I can at least see it and like it yeah. um, but I find that that preview process especially in comedy is important pacing and timing a joke and sometimes you have to open up a space because the laugh you get buries the next line. Yeah. You just need a little room because you don't want to step on the laugh. So you want to let it happen and then... Let it kind of breathe a little bit then go to the next... Uh... Yeah, and that, that, that was a, a big education for me. So when you started directing Revenge of the Nerds and subsequent films, True Beverly Hills, uh, V.I. Wachowski, you weren't editing. You you were just directing only. So well, you were, were you delegating a lot to your the, editor the, that you the truth hired? Is, the truth is I had an editor on every one of those movies... And without, well, I guess I can't say without naming names because the names are on the movies, but none of them were satisfactory to me. And so on every one of those movies, I had my own cutting room. I just didn't take a credit. So were, so were you editing while they were editing as well? So there were two different... Uh... Well, they would, they would put together the movie while I was shooting. Yeah. And then I would watch it. And I would think, oh man, this needs a lot of work. And then I would give notes. But I found that I'm sitting around anyway, and instead of like telling this guy some notes and sitting over his shoulder or telling this guy some notes and going and killing two hours while he made the changes, and, and also for me, editing is very, um, it's trial and error. It's not, you don't, you don't come in and say, use take four for that line. No, you think maybe when you're watching dailies, take four is the best reading of that line. And then you put it in context and you go, you know what, let me look at take three, let me yeah. look at take two. It's just and, and things change constantly. So rather than go through this process of like sitting with this guy and saying, now try to take two and now try this and cut a little bit sooner and this and that, it's just easier to do it myself. So And you knew how to operate the equipment. Yeah, so I had been doing it. So I just it, yeah. set up my own cutting room, got in my own assistant. And so on, on Nerds, there was an editor and he had an assistant and it became a little ugly. It was like he knew I was recutting his stuff and he was resentful and angry because I'm the director, so my way goes. Yeah. And so we didn't get along that well. And then on the next movie, uh, I guess it was Gotcha. Anthony Edwards. Uh, Anthony Edwards movie. Yeah. Where I, I very intelligently fought off several actors in order to keep Anthony playing the lead in Gotcha because the studios were saying, well, we got this other guy that we could get for this movie his name is Tom Cruise and I said no was that after Top Gun because he no, was in before, uh, oh that was before. before Top Gun yeah so they wanted they wanted Tom Cruise to play in Gotcha and I said but it's about a guy who hasn't been laid and we all know Tom Cruise got laid a lot in risky business so he can't play a virgin anymore <laughs> no I won't have him and they said well what about Johnny Depp and I go oh, he's weird I don't want him and I, I fought for Anthony and I got Anthony the job and uh so they had 
they want the studio wanted an editor because yeah. there, there is this sense that the director shouldn't be the editor because he won't be objective. Well, now you see people like Steven Soderbergh or even like Alfonso Cuarón; they're all editing their own movies. Or, you know, because it's such of, an yeah. inter- it's like writing. You're writing yeah. with film. You're not just assembling what somebody else dictates notes about. And you're learning while you're doing it, so it is. It's all part of the process. And yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine not being the editor of anything. And I also, did. too, as a director, you're shooting footage, and you sort of have an understanding where one shot leads to another, and how things. You do, are. although you, that often changes. But but yeah, it, and you and, and if you know how to do it, why be just sitting around while someone else is doing it? You can do it and and, and explore while you're doing it. So, yeah. I so I did it on every movie, and I alienated every editor. I'm sure there's a lot of editors going around saying bad things about me. Um, but that's just, that's just the way it was. Yeah. The girl who was my... She was an apprentice, actually, that they, they gave her to me as my nerd's assistant. is now a big-time editor. And she's really good. Her name is Deborah Neal. And uh, she does the Hangover movies and lots of movies. Yeah. Uh, and I, I respect her. I don't disrespect every editor. There are there some editors who are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I just didn't have them on my movies. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about uh, your friendship with Kirk Douglas. Uh, you worked on so many films with him, and uh, okay, so recently the stage play. I uh, think before I forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kirk, Kirk, he was actually chosen by the producer on Eddie Macon's run. Yeah, he wasn't my choice. By uh, Martin Bregman. By Bregman. Yeah. Bregman said, "We need a guy with foreign sales." Uh, Clout. Uh, what about Kirk Douglas? And I said, yeah. I was thinking more of like Peter Boyle or Gene Hackman or you know, tough New York cop. No, we're hiring Kirk Douglas. I said, all right. <laughs> Sending me out to meet with Kirk Douglas. He also forced me to hire John Schneider to play the lead in that movie. I didn't want John Schneider. He's a good guy, but I didn't want him. I wanted yeah. somebody else. But so I go meet with Kirk Douglas, and Kirk says, uh, "I saw your Natural Enemies movies. A, a movie I liked it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to work on this movie." I went great shake hands go, I go down to Texas to start making the movie about the second week because Kirk wasn't in half the movie he was only in his stuff he shows up on location and he sends me this long memo with lots of script notes yeah. and I was the writer on that movie too so and I thought my job as writer and director is to defend what I've written rather than let the actors take over and change it. So I had a meeting the first day. Kirk came on location in his hotel, and he said, did you read my memo? And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you think? I said, well, let's go through it. So I start going through his memo. Point one, I go, I don't really want to do this for this and this reason. Yeah. Point two, yeah, I see what you're saying here, but I think it should, it's better the way it is. I go about through about five or six notes or seven notes, and he goes, you know, I've made a few movies too. And uh, I may not be right all the time, but I'm not wrong all the time either. So why don't you get the fuck out of my hotel room? And he throws me out of his hotel room. <laughs> I went, oh my God, have I blown it with Kirk Douglas? I'm going to have a miserable experience. Next morning, knock on my door. Kirk's driver, Mr. Douglas would like you to ride out to the location with him in his trailer. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I go and Now at least I've slept, because that was at the end of a shooting day where I was all drained and defensive. And yeah. He goes, look, he goes, I've made a lot of movies. I respect what you did in your other movie, and I think you're, you know, I, re- I read the script, I mean, I respect the script, but you got to learn how to deal with actors. And you can't make the actor feel like you're not listening. Even if you don't want to do everything they say, or anything they say, you got to make them feel like you're open and you're listening. I said, ah, oh, I get it. And then we got into the specific scene that we were shooting that day, which was one of the notes that I objected to. He's a tough cop, and he's interrogating this kind of bimbo woman in Texas. And he had said to me, I don't want it to be an interrogation. I want it to be a seduction. And I thought, oh, God, he's like an old guy who wants to still be sexy on screen. Oh. So I, and I said, no. So yeah. I go, well, tell me what you mean about this seduction thing. He goes, I don't mean I'm, gonna, I don't mean I'm trying to fuck her. I mean, instead of trying to bully her into telling me what I want to know, I'm going to seduce her into telling me. I went, oh. And then he told me a story about uh, in the movie Champion where he was a tough boxer and yeah. he has a conversation with the female lead and 
he has to say to her basically the line, you know, if you don't do what I say, you're going to spend the, you're going to spend a lot of time in the hospital, yeah. which is a big threat. He goes, he goes now. He said when I was shooting that, I thought I'm a boxer, I'm a tough guy. She's a woman. I can't like say you're going to spend a lot of time in the hospital. <laughs> I got to like make it quiet. So he, he said so when she was touching my arm, I just went like this and sort of trapped her hand in my arm, and I said, you know. If you don't, and I smiled and I said, if you don't do what I say, you're going to spend a lot of time in the hospital. And I thought, oh, that's so much more interesting. So I just decided I'm going to go to Kirk Douglas School from that time on. And for the rest of the three weeks that he worked with me on that movie, every day I would learn something from him. And you know, at the end of the shooting day, he would say, where are we shooting tomorrow? I'd say, well, the police station or whatever. He goes, let's go there now. Oh, you're kidding. Like, we just finished this whole day of work. He goes, it doesn't matter. Let's go there without the crew and work out what we're going to do tomorrow. Because he, he, he has also produced a lot of movies. Yeah. He said, that way you're not wasting the time and the money of everybody standing around while you're figuring out how to do the scene or how you're covering it. Let's go there now. Went, okay. So I went there and sure enough, we'd walk through the scene and talk about it. And I think, oh, yeah, now I know. I can see it. So the next morning when it, the actors are there and the crew is there. We can sort of, in short time, lay out the scene. And the crew can watch and they can start lighting. Yeah. As opposed to everybody get there the next morning and go through this figuring out process where you're sort of standing in the spotlight and, you, and it, it, you're less actually less open and less creative because you're under the pressure of all these people and the top clock is ticking and the money's being spent. So I learned, okay, prep the night before. Oh, I'll always do that, which I try to do. Yeah. Do you like to make shot lists uh, before yeah. the day shoot? At all? I make a shot list. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, not, it's always subject to change, but I just know the pieces that I think I'll need, you know. And they're, yeah. they're often, you know, kind of a normal list of, you know, yeah, I want to make sure I have this wide shot, I want to make sure I have tight here and tight there and some overs. And the more complex shots sort of evolve when you're on location. You can't, necessarily imagine them or I can't yeah when I'm alone especially if you're in a location you can't move walls it's not like a sound stage yeah there's all there's all kinds of limitations I mean unless you have all the money in the world then you can do whatever you want whatever you can imagine you can accomplish but not when you're not when you're on a lower budget movie you you have to live within those limitations so I learned all that from Kirk and we went through that process and when it was all over I mean I loved the guy and I admired him and I thought he was good in the movie and we kind of stayed friends and, and uh, we'd see each other every few weeks and hang out and then I guess I went and made uh, I made Nerds didn't see Kirk much during that process then I made Gotcha saw him a little bit and then it was uh, the producer that the guy who had, Joe was in who had hired me at, on Nerds now had left his job or gotten fired and came with this tough guy script and he said, can you get this to Kirk for me? And I said, yeah. And I got it to Kirk, and Kirk got it to Bert, and all of a sudden we got tough guys going. And uh, the good news is I loved making that movie and working with Kirk Douglas and Bert Lancaster. The bad news is Bert had decided that I'm Kirk's bitch because we had worked together before, and so he didn't like me. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, he think he thought I was protecting Kirk, which I wasn't, or only listening to Kirk, which I wasn't. And, and Bert was... So if you gave him any type of direction at all, he would sort of shy away from you? And, not so uh, much the direction, but in the, in the process of prepping the movie and working on the script, Kirk always had ideas. Let's try this, let's try that. And Bert didn't want to do that. He was older and he was cranky and he just, let's just shoot the fucking script as it is. And he, okay. he, he used to say, you know, he, I work with Kirk a lot of times and he always does this shit. I should have realized it, and I don't, I should, that's why I didn't want to work with him again. But I, it's funny because Burt Lancaster was also a producer and had a company for so many years. So you would yeah. think he would be more collaborative in that sense. But you would think, but it just wasn't like that. And I mean, he was great. I, I, I rarely had to direct him, except you know, maybe just slow him down a little bit or pick up his energy. But I don't have to tell him how to be Burt Lancaster. He knew how to do that. And, I don't know. He, Kirk got on his nerves because Kirk was always trying something new, he, <laughs> you know. And uh, I mean, I remember one time we were shooting a scene where Kirk comes out of a bar, and uh, they meet in the street. And it, it turns out their old hangout has now become a gay bar, and 
Kirk says, don't go in there, Harry. And, and so we're, we're shooting towards the bar, and Kirk's walking towards us, and Bert's going this way, and they meet. And so we're mostly favoring Kirk in the shot, and I was going to cover it. And so we'd rehearse, and we'd shoot the first take, and all of a sudden there's like a scuffle that breaks out in front of the camera. And I hear Kirk saying, get your fucking hands off me, Bert. Mm. I, I go, what's that? Cut. He goes, I know what you're trying to... Bert was trying to move Kirk around so that it was they were facing each other <laughs> rather than be more favoring Kirk. He was make it very get, even. Very even. <laughs> get your fucking hands off me, Bert. So I said, well, we're going to cover this. And, uh, anyway, they, were, they always had moments like that. In between, they, they were friends. They were old friends. Yeah. But they, they got did in, like maybe six movies. Six together. movies on a play. Yeah. And, you know, but it, it, was, it was a very good experience for me because I had two big stars with all kinds of issues like that and I had to survive and I guess what does not kill me makes me stronger so <laughs> that, that, that was helpful yeah uh, but years later when uh, you did the play uh, Before I Forget with him which I guess was also filmed into sort of a documentary type uh, yeah I mean, it was like a, as well a, yeah we, we filmed it I mean we had to like kind of misrepresent what we were doing because you're not allowed to bring more than one camera into any actor's equity uh, theater. Really? You don't have a camera in the back, wide shot in the back just to record it for posterity, but you can't shoot it like you would shoot a film because then the actors have to be paid as if they're in a film. Uh, so you would have to pay sort of SAG and actor's equity yeah. all together in right. one. Yeah. So somehow I managed to convince the, the people that it was just for Kirk's archives and could we please have a couple of extra cameras for close-ups, but it's just for Kirk, which it really was at the time. But then when, when Kirk saw it, he thought, I want to release this as a movie and give the money to the motion picture home. And it's charity, so who's going to object? So yeah. there was a little politics, but that's, that's what happened. And so it came out as a DVD with all the proceeds going to the actor's home. That's great. And uh, when you were directing him in that play, was that sort of a unique situation? He was... Uh, I think 92 years old. He had had a stroke. Oh, yeah. It was, com- he was, it was no completely one. unique. I mean, look, he wrote it. It was a one-man show. It, yeah. Yeah, most of the people around him, his family, his, not Michael so much, but his other son, were saying, Dad, don't do this. You're going to embarrass yourself. You know, you've got a stroke. And you're getting up on stage. And he wanted to do it. And I just thought, he's Kirk Douglas, and it's his life, and, and the writing is pretty good, and he wants to do it. And, I'm willing to like you know help him get it done. So yeah. I was there helping in like I was a cheerleader and a sounding board and whatever. And uh, I thought up the title, uh, but it was all him. And actually, right until the weekend that we did it, no one was 100 percent sure that he could go through it all the way in one in one sitting, you know, for a, a live audience. But he was great, and he did fourth shows. And then never was able to do it again. He just said, I could never get through it, even mm-hmm. one more time. Because they wanted him to take it to New York. And he just said, I oh, it would have been on Broadway. Yeah. and uh, Couldn't do it. What, so what was kind of your conceptual idea of how to uh, stage it with him on stage? Very was, simple. Uh, you know, I mean, not that, you know, the, the simplest way would be one chair and a screen with the scenes that whatever we're projecting behind him. Yeah. And then, but he felt like, no, he, I, I think I should get up. So we said, we put a chair over here and a chair over there that way. Because sometimes literally crossing the stage, he'd need to sit down. You know, to rest and to rest. get energy and then get so back up. So we worked it out, you know, that he'd, he'd be here for a while and then he'd come to the center stage and then maybe go to the other chair and stay there for a while. And then it was really just about sharing the seg- sections of the stage and standing whenever he could and sitting whenever he needed to. That was really what dictated the blocking of that. But once he's in the process of doing it, his energy was strong, and then he'd be completely spent, you know, afterwards. So, uh, and you know, the, I don't know if you ever saw it. Did you ever see it? Uh, there are little clips on YouTube. But there was a great one on your YouTube page where he's talking he's to the screen. Himself. Yeah, it's like his, that was his younger him. self. That was and, all uh, him. He just <laughs> he had that. He had done that at a at a some convention that he spoke at where he argued with it himself but it was he had done that years back years back yeah. where it was the same age as the guy up on the screen so now he, he said what can we do with that thing where I argue with myself 
and we kind of rewrote it as old Kirk talking to young Kirk, and it worked even better because you know he was like a different guy now. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the, the, the thing at the end when he t he tells a story and the thing about how his father never gave him any credit, never gave him a pat on the back. And he always saw his father's approval and never got it. Yeah. And once when he was in a school play, his father showed up. And at the end of the play, his father gave him an ice cream cone. And he tells this story as part of the play. And he goes, that ice cream cone was my Oscar. So I thought, what can we do? At the end of the play, after he's taking his bows for having finished the play, yeah. it would be cool if somebody gave him an ice cream cone. Because he talks about that in the play. And Michael volunteered to do it. So the first night, Michael Douglas walks out on stage and gives Kirk Douglas an ice cream cone. It was great. Must have shocked the audience. Yeah, they loved it. They roared. It was great. Stuff like that. No, but I mean, that's incredible at his age to have the stamina. To, you Amazing. Know, even to go through it once is incredible. And yeah. With his, you know, the stroke and everything else, he's overcome so much. And he really has. And, you know, and he, start, so he starts right off the beginning talking about, yeah. you know, when you have a stroke, peep, you have to speak slowly to be understood. But I find... When, when I talk slowly, people listen. <laughs> they think I'm going to say something important. <laughs> you know, it's like that. Yeah, he, he's great. And I, I, mean, I just, I see him all the time. And I get to, like, it was Michael's birthday this week, and so I had to go to Kirk's house and film him a happy birthday message to Michael because he didn't want to travel back east to go to the birthday party. And yeah. I'm always doing stuff like that with him. It's, I mean, I love that I know Kirk Douglas, you know, <laughs> even though he's, he's an old Kirk Douglas now. We go to, uh, Spielberg's mother has a restaurant on uh, Pico Boulevard. She does it, she's 92, and she does that just oh. to keep active and alive, and they get along great. So, like, once a month, Kirk and I will go to, there for, for lunch, and Spielberg's mother, and they hug, and they, it's cute, they're cute. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little about Paul Mazursky, uh, who passed away recently. I know yeah. you guys had a great friendship uh, toward the end of his life and did that great web series, uh, well, Noel Brooks. And it, yeah, I mean, it, it, we, 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 the idea was to keep that going, but the, yeah. Kirk was, I mean, uh, Paul was not well enough to keep doing it, so we, we did a few of them, and then it was like, that was that. I guess you guys uh, shot that, was it last year or the year before? Or, uh, was it the year before. year before? Spillover, I don't know. Maybe it was the very beginning of the previous year. Uh Probably not last year because he he got really messed up. He had so many things, you know, medical problems that he wasn't really able to do much that last year. How so did maybe, you guys first meet? Well, the first time we worked together, I was a trailer guy, and he was doing Harry and Tonto and Bloom and Love and Next Stop Grand Trilogy. I worked on those trailers, yeah, for the studio, and he was the director. So we just met at you know a screening. We didn't really hang out or anything. And then uh, when I did Natural Enemies, there was sort of this uh, uh, way that filmmakers used to work where, and they probably still do, where they show each other their movies and give each other notes, which nobody really wants notes from anybody. They, they just want everybody to tell them that the movie's great, but when they get notes, they have to be polite and listen and then disregard them later or whatever. Yeah. So I thought, well, I've done this movie now. I should try to get another director to watch it. Well, I know Paul Mazursky. I'll ask him. So I asked him, and he watched the movie. He was brutal. <laughs> yeah, he just goes, what the fuck? He goes, this thing is such a downer, and it's all so one note, and the music is down, and the performance is down, and the way it's shot. Oh, God, what are you, crazy? That was his note. So, But he was honest. And then I didn't see him for a while, and I did Nerds, and I did Gotcha, and I was doing... Tough guys, and I called him for a recommendation on an art director. I had worked on uh, Down and Out in Beverly Hills, I think. Yeah. So he gave the guy a good recommendation, and he said, to, "He said, uh, so now you're in the, now you're a director." I said, "Yeah." He goes, "So now you know you're in the club now. You're in, you know the secret now." I said, "What's the secret?" He goes, "It's not about your creative vision. It's is there enough money for take two? <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, yeah, I guess that, that is sort of the secret. And then, didn't see him for a while, uh, and I ran into him in 2004 or five at a funeral. And in the interim, I had done a film in Russia, 
And he said to me, he just got back from Russia. And I go, oh, I, I worked in Russia. He goes, yeah, I just did this thing. I brought some camera guys with me and I filmed this event in Kiev or near Kiev where 25,000 Hasidic Jews gathered around a lake to sing and dance and pray for three days. And he says, I'm thinking maybe I could make it into a documentary. I said, yeah, maybe. And all I was thinking was, God, who would want to see that? And he said, well, I, maybe you watch the dailies and tell me, maybe you'll edit it for me. So I said, yeah, okay. And it's Paul Mazursky, and I really admire him. And All right, so I watched the dailies. And instead of hating them, they were great because he's in it. Yeah. And so he interacts it's with It's his these. personal story. I'm a, he, he's yeah, there and, and it's his, his energy. And so when, yeah. when he's with this group of Hasidic guys having dinner, he makes them laugh. They, they loosen up. You know, it, it was, he got an energy out of them that I never thought they had. And the whole movie is infused with this great, his personality and getting them to relax. And, 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 and the, the spiritual thing is there, but it's, more, it's a much more secular movie than one would think. And so we put it together, and I thought it came out really well, and took it to some film festivals. Yeah. Never that was called uh, Yippee, Yippee, right? Yeah. Never could get distribution. But in that process, he and I became good friends. And yeah. so that was 2005, and so now it's 2014. So for nine years, we've been hanging out, doing nothing, because most, mostly we've been doing nothing. <laughs> Going to lunch, talking, thinking about a project. Uh, he directed some plays. I directed one... Uh, National Lampoon movie, but we we spent a lot of time together, and he was a funny guy and great to hang out with, and I'm friends with his daughter and his family, and, and yeah, it was, it, 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 one of the things that that I said at at uh, I wasn't really it was at his memorial service, I guess that we just had, but you for, you know you can't be good friends with a guy if you were walking around thinking he's a genius. Yeah. So you have to forget that. You have to just he's Paul, you know, and, and we have laughs together, we hang out together and in putting this video together for his memorial it's service. It's a really great tribute that I saw that on YouTube. Yeah. The, uh, putting that together, yeah. it reminded me, oh my god, this guy is amazing. He writes these things, he directs these things. He he's brilliant and and yet he seems like such a are you Jewish? Yeah. Ham, <laughs> Hamish a guy, you know. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, he's not this artist, and yet he is. And you you kind of you can't be friends with him without seeing him as Paul, you know, the Jew that used to work in the Catskills. That's who he is. He's a funny, cool guy, yeah. but he's also this artist, and he's also this brilliant writer. And uh, I kind of had lost sight of that to a certain extent until I started working on that video, and I realized, wow. I mean, it made me really, really regain all my respect and admiration for him, and lose most of my self esteem. <laughs> and to see how original those movies were, like Bob and Carol and Ted yeah, Dallas, original and Moscow and, and the Hudson, socially and Tonto. relevant and cutting edge, and the performances were great. It was just like, I mean, I can't literally think of another American filmmaker like him. I mean, yeah. Scorsese, his films are a certain way, and he doesn't write them. Uh, Sidney Pollack doesn't write them. Mark Rydell doesn't write them. Uh, Soderbergh doesn't write his films. Paul Mazursky wrote and directed and produced all of his movies. I mean, it's just pretty amazing. And they're all so good, mostly. The long version of that thing that's on YouTube, because when I first put it together, it was like almost an hour long. That was your first cut? It was like an hour yeah. long? And people kept saying, you can't make people sit at the service for an hour and watch this thing. Cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. So a lot of the stuff like the, the uh, scenes from a mall part isn't there the pickle part isn't there uh, faithful is, they, they maybe take all those parts out but they're watching him comment about his failures is maybe more interesting than watching him comment about his successes you know it's kind of because he has a good ironic take on all that <laughs> so just yesterday I had to deliver five of the 53 minute versions to, to Mel Brooks and these other guys they wanted to see the long version so oh, wow. maybe you should post that uh some time for people to see. <laughs> I think people are sitting on YouTube for an hour and watch something. I mean, isn't that about short attention span? I don't yeah. know. I know <laughs> my son is a filmmaker and he wouldn't watch it. <laughs> well, Paul Mazursky in every one of his interviews, uh, even from like the clips that you've shown, he has such like a dynamic personality. Oh, that yeah. comes out. Yep. And, uh, yeah. It's just amazing. And he always did right until the end. I mean, literally in the hospital on his last day, 
he was still funny. But he was terrified and and uncomfortable. And I mean, we didn't really know that he was going to die that day because I mean, we watched the, we were in his room watching the Yankee game, and then I left for a while. And by the time I came back, he was gone. But uh, he was mostly still himself. Not not as sharp, you know. And I mean, just the idea that you know you kind of know you're you're not going to come out of this hospital is kind of a very sad and weird thing and all the people that loved him there's a real certain relief factor that you know finally Paul's out of pain and out of this sense of, of he knows he's going and it's just a matter of when yeah. so it was, it was a mixed thing but afterwards you know the fact that I, that I can't go to lunch with him anymore and the fact that you know there's a lot of people that the, the, the people he used to hang out with at the farmer's market every morning that group is sort of now without a, 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 a the heart of that is gone. And Mel Brooks has this luncheon every Friday in Beverly Hills with Mel, Dick Donner, Alan Ladd, a guy named Mike Gruskoff, Jay Cantor, and Paul. Yeah. And now no Paul. So now it's all Mel. Mel's, and Mel liked having Paul because Paul's funny, so Mel doesn't have to be on all the time. Now it's, I guess... I'm, I'm, I've never gone to that, but it's now. Well, you see a little glimpse in the web series of uh, Richard Donner and yeah, yeah, yeah. Brooks, and them sort of riffing on each other. Yeah, and they're. they're so that's... Yep. Uh, well, I was going to ask you if uh, there's any sort of lesson that you've learned over the years being in this business that you may want to kind of pass on to. The lesson is <laughs> make good choices, don't piss off powerful people. Um, If you have a vision, try to stick to it, but not to the point of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and like all these cliches that everybody says are absolutely true. Casting is like 90% of making a movie. And yeah. if it's not in the script, you know, you're not going to suddenly manufacture it on the set. 